So one of the, I think one of the most interesting stories about research is the sort of history of Enigma and World War II. And if anyone's ever seen this, this is an Enigma machine. It originally started off as a financial encryption machine before the Nazis decided to take it on, make it really, really complicated, and then use it to send encrypted communications between not necessarily high command, but it was used for distributing orders from one centralized location, such as a rear end echelon post, to front end troops. One of the reasons we are literally still speaking English is because we were able to break this machine, and not just us, it was actually largely in part of the Polish. And this is quite an interesting analog to sort of how modern day cybersecurity works. So one of the things about the Enigma machine that people don't know is that it was actually uncrackable and is pretty difficult today, even with modern day computer equipment. It's, I think it was a 150 million, 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 million combinations of key space before we were able to break it. So you basically have to sit there and try 150 million, 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 million times to be able to break a message. Apart from there was one single flaw with the Enigma. If you encrypted a character, such as A, it would never, ever be encrypted in itself. And the fact that this was one of the problems with Enigma was the reason we were able to break it and reduce the war effort by three to four years. It is unknown that this was actually first discovered by the Polish, and then it was made complicated by the Nazis. And the Polish, about three weeks before World War II, fled to the UK. Once they were in the UK, they spoke to people called like Alan Turing and Alistair Dennison, decided to set up a place near Milton Keynes called Bletchley Park in a big manor house, and they built a machine called the bomb. So the bomb is essentially three, or I think it's like 36 Enigma machines. So you have an Enigma machine, an Enigma machine, an Enigma machine. And what it would do is, using this initial linchpin of a weakness, of you cannot encode a character as itself, it would be used to try and crack the code just enough for us to be able to decrypt ciphers. However, that's only one part of the story. We, as a nation, knew that Enigma, if it didn't have this one flaw, was literally impossible to crack. So if we knew it was literally impossible to crack, especially because computers weren't invented, we decided to build a machine called a Type X machine. This Type X machine, for all intents and purposes, operated very similar to an Enigma machine with that one flaw removed. And the point of this entire sort of introduction is that the only reason we knew this was never broken during World War II is because we first started to attack the thing. So this takes me to my point. What does a government vulnerability researcher do? So I was a government vulnerability researcher for. I guess between four and eight years, depending on your definition. I did four years at GCHQ as a researcher, did some operational stuff overseas. I did four years working for Huawei, attacking 5G uh, products within the UK to make sure they were safe. You've probably seen it in the news to do with backdoors in Chinese equipment. It's a bit of a sort of convoluted topic. But the entire point of it was, is how could we know how to build this without first being able to break the Enigma machine to ensure that this was actually sort of okay. So in the UK, intelligence is distribu distributed into three parts. GCHQ, Government Communication Headquarter, based in Cheltenham, are responsible for cyber and electrical intelligence. They have there's an offensive and a defensive side. MI5, not many people know, but are based in Thames House in London, north of the river. What they do is very much focused on internal security, so they're very much interested in preventing terrorist attack and attacks, uh, narcotics, economic infringement within the UK. And we have SIS, you may know them more commonly as MI6. MI6 is very much responsible for anything overseas. So intelligence is really drawn into two areas. SIGINT, signals intelligence, this is computers and electronics, and HUMINT, human intelligence, where you either try and blackmail or pay someone or some agent for some information or to enact some policy you want enacting. If you look about here, this is actually a picture of me. So I was actually in that poppy at that time. 
It was about seven years ago. But this sort of leads me on to what my actual main job was within GCHQ, now called NCSC. NCSC, the defensive side, to GCHQ's offensive side. So NCSC are very much concerned with how do we actually defend the nation from attacks. And NCSC are what's called the National Technical Authority. So while they are very, very government heavy, trying to help people like the NHS, school system, the cabin office from actually being attacked and vulnerable, it also makes sense to create a very safe environment for businesses to operate. So it's not just about making sure our own government is safe. It's also about how do we make the UK a safe place to be able to do business from cyber attacks and normal terrorist attacks. And this terrorist attack or cyber attack business is pretty much the core of NCSC. And the one thing I will say about NCSC is they are very good for publishing online guidance. So this is one of the online guidance of biometric recognition systems. This is something I had a lot to do with. Not a lot of people know that I'm actually a biometrics expert, or I'd like to say biometrics expert, um, just because I started out my career within GCHQ doing a lot of biometrics. So the general broad steps to operating as a researcher within the UK government is Number one, we want to decide on a technology or see a technology that our enemy uses. It can be terrorists, such as the Taliban or Islamic State. It can be hostile governments. Don't really want to say who they are. Um, but once we've sort of established what the technology is, we're very much interested in, can we break the thing? It's very beneficial to the UK government or any government, as was the case with Enigma, if we can break something, then we know not just how to break it, how secure it is, but we can actually get viable, up-to-date intelligence on our targets. And not just that, the other interesting thing is, can they break the thing? Because if they can't break it, then it actually puts us in a better position, much in, in the same way I was describing the Typex machine, to be able to use the technology to defend ourselves. And then the question is, can we use it? Because if we can use it, then it prevents them being able to access it. The final bit is, if it is insecure in some way, as was the case of the Enigma machine, can we secure the thing? If we can secure the thing, the next question, can businesses use it? Can people within the UK, can the UK government actually use this technology based on all this research people like me did to be able to use it for benefiting the UK as a whole? So I was very much focused and operating in this model in biometrics and smart cards or identity technologies. Some of the technologies I was involved with was facial recognition. In fact, I've got a very good sort of case sample that I worked on um, seven years ago of this technology and what we sort of went through to break about it and what we thought about when we were breaking it and how we use that to then influence government decisions. Palm vein recognition, actually something I know too much about. Iris recognition, a really interesting thing about iris recognition is there are two ways to recognize an eye. You either do it with your retina, which is the back of your eye, or you do it with an iris, which is right at the front of your eye. No one uses retinal technology, even though everyone says retinal scan, because it's very bloody intrusive. You can do iris scans from a set distance, whereas retinal scans, you basically have to touch your eyeball to a, to a, to a scanner. Other things I did, uh, sort of iPhones, or I don't want to say iPhones, but fingerprint scanners. So very much when I was still working in the biometrics department, fingerprint scanners actually became quite ubiquitous in their use. So it's very interesting to people like ministers of what is the security level and the security policy we need to set on things like iPhones and how secure are fingerprint scanners. The other piece of it was smart cards. How secure are bank cards? How secure can you use an actual card or a SIM card that goes into your phone? Not many people know that your bank card and your SIM card are exactly the same technology. A SIM card is just a cut-out bank card. And the final piece that I worked a lot with was NFC, so mobile payments, actually intercepting and being able to hack NFC payments, being able to use uh, cards that you use that are probably used to get into this building, how secure are they, can we break into them, can we hack them, very much sort of the things I was into. So, so one of the, the, the sort of example I wanted to use was these NEC biometric scanners at airports. So obviously this has quite a lot of impact within the UK, and we need to make sure that if the UK airports or the UK, I guess, ports of authority are going to go and buy some big facial recognition systems, 
are they any good and can they be attacked? So the one thing I will, I will say with biometric systems in this way or in this sense is that things like wearing normal masks are probably not going to work. There's an element of liveness detection. So biometrics always come in two pieces. There is always a number one, can I recognize the individual? And number two, are they alive? Liveness detection. Because if I take a picture up to your computer and you use facial recognition to log in, one of the easiest ways to be able to detect the thing is if I'm actually moving in the picture. Is there some live bit of information I can use to deduce that whether or not this is a picture or whether or not this is actually a real person? The other piece of facial recognition is once you've passed this liveness detection piece is first finding the face. So half of facial recognition is just being able to find a face within an image. The second part is being able to recognize the face once you've found it. And this is really interesting because if you imagine you're a nefarious deviant that is going into a casino, and casinos do use this technology quite a lot, they're not necessarily interested in who is coming through their casino. They just want to make sure that you don't come in. They want to basically kick you out if they are able to recognize you. But as I said, the first phase of being able to recognize you is being able to detect a face. So you can almost think of it like you're a ghost to facial recognition. And there's a really interesting project called CV Dazzle. And it's, um, the idea was is to, to put up really weird patterns. And I know this looks a bit silly, but to put really weird patterns on your face that basically confuse facial detection, not facial recognition. Remember, this is about detecting whether or not a face exists in a picture or within a video. Because if I can defeat the ability for you to detect a face, then I'm able to be able to sneak through your casino. Another example would be if I'm going through an airport and I get forced into a facial recognition scanner, I might not be able to defeat the facial recognition scanner. What I could do is defeat the human. So if I was told to go in the line for the facial recognition scanner, I sat there after five or six times, it fails every time, I go and take my fake documents to the human who me, as an agent with the operating within the UK, finds it much easier to be able to get through that border check. This looks really weird, but one of the things that people don't realize about facial recognition, even fingerprint recognition and palm vein recognition, is that it uses near-infrared light. It uses near-infrared light in, I think it's about the 650 nanometer. And what your actual picture looks like to a facial recognition is this complete black and white image without color, but more importantly, without shadows. Near-infrared light is very good at reducing the amount of shadows on a face. So, face paint is normally exists because it's very good at being able to dress you up as a hippo or a lion or one of your other favorite animals. However, there is a type of face paint that exists that is very good at changing the IR profile of the thing that you're putting the paint onto. It turns out the military actually used this because it's able to defeat people that are using either night vision or using infrared at long distances. So what you can do if you want to go and mess around with an airport scanner or you want to go and break into your favorite casino that you've been banned from, you can go and buy some of this paint that is a very similar skin tone to you. It doesn't even necessarily have to be visible, but if you're able to break up your face in such a way using this NIR paint, all of their scanners will use NIR. So things that we would do is literally get a facial recognition scanner within GCHQ or go down to an airport, put all this weird camo paint on us in really weird squares and see, can we actually break through the system? So that's the first stage. The first attack we're very interested in, can people just not be able to recognize the humans? Because that might be good enough. Remember, everything about cybersecurity is is we only need to achieve what's just good enough. We don't need to be amazing super spies. We just need to be able to defeat the system just enough that allows us to actually carry out some action. So this is normally, this is a, so this is a passport. What actually happens with these systems is when you take your passport, there's a little NFC chip in it. You scan your NFC chip and it's got a very high definition quality image within the chip itself. One of the biggest problems with this would be is how do you then protect that information? Because if you had a scanner of people walking past with their passport, you'd be able to download remotely from within their pocket a bunch of information about themselves, a bunch of personal details. 
Fortunately, the government and the network of people that use these passports thought of this. This here is actually the security key that's used to decrypt this information. So normally when you use a passport, you show your passport to the scanner, they take it. This is why you always need to take this page. You can't just do it remotely. Sorry, you can't just do it without opening. It will, the, the scanner will scan this key here, read the information remotely from your chip, use this key to decrypt that information, part of it, which is a high definition image that can be used to do facial recognition on you. However, there's one important problem with this picture. And can anyone perceive what it is? Or guess what the problem is? He's got his glasses on. This actually happened. So the one thing you've got to realize about facial recognition scanners is that there are many different types and there are many different qualities. Some of them are proprietary, some of them better than others. And it was up to us to build and test these this systems in such a way that we could establish a very good policy of how we actually protect our borders. A really interesting thing about biometrics that not many people realize is you were all rated on this bell curve. So this bell curve will operate in terms of in the middle, this is your average match. This is a 50-50 chance of being matched. Anything above a particular threshold, which you would set based on policy that people like me did the research for, would match and pass you through the gate. So one of the important things with biometrics that people really need to understand is biometrics aren't just about recognizing you within a crowd of people. They can be, but it doesn't perform very well. There is actually quite a lot of assurance in the fact that you first need your passport to be unlocked, which verifies that you have a physical token, which you then use to decrypt and then use to facial recognition against you. However, there is always this threshold. There is always some line that exists somewhere on this bell curve, and you only need to defeat the system just enough to be recognized. A lot of people say that fingerprints are unique to you in the world, and while that is true at the molecular level, molecular level, that also is also true of anything else at the molecular level, it is completely unique. However, to the algorithms and through things like quantizing, the problem is, is that if you just scanned your fingerprint or your face or your iris against the entire planet, you would probably have matches with tens of thousands, if not millions of people. I almost guarantee if you scanned against enough people, someone would be recognized as looking more like you than you. And that is, a, that is just a flaw of biometrics. Because they, are no, they can never be perfect, because every time you go to scan a biometric, it will always be different, there will always be different shadows, you'll always be happy or sad or have different hair length, different beard length, sometimes wearing glasses. The problem is that you will never be 100% recognizable. So you can imagine, if you wear glasses within a passport photograph, and then I wear your glasses, some element of those glasses will actually be used during that biometric recognition. So if I typically or normally matched against you here, I'm left of that threshold. All I need to do is steal your passport and get right of that threshold. If I wear glasses and it pushes me past that threshold, that is enough to be able to defeat the system. And where we set that threshold, where we set policies, of what, when and where you should be allowed and not allowed to wear glasses is entirely based on research people like me did in GCHQ, and just doing the hard work. However, we also get to the more wacky end of the spectrum. If the first attack was just not being able to be recognized as a face, the second attack was, I'm going to go and use your glasses to be recognized as you. The third attack, literally, was we would just go and build a bunch of fake silicon faces. It sounds very mission impossible, but there are companies out there that do it. One of my favorite companies was a homoerotic Chinese company that you could literally scan for deviant reasons or sexual reasons. You would have someone that you wanted to fantasize with or you wanted to have a muscular bodysuit. They would actually take a 3D scan, you would send the file to them, and they were happy sending you a 3D sort of facial recognition of you. If I could want to pretend to be you, say you're the Prime Minister, I wanted to steal your passport and pretend to be the Prime Minister, I am not above using sexual and homoeroticism to be able to defeat a system, because an attacker would do it. I'm more than happy to go and go to these websites and pay for these things if it achieves my goal. And it's always about achieving my minimal goal. So we were basically just buying the most weird things you could think of from the government perspective 
just to be able to test these systems because we have no limitation based on what the attacker would do. We would do all of this research, we'd go through, we'd buy all of this material, we would actually test it just to be able to implement these policies. And this would take me full circle. So we would go back to how does NCSC set this policy? It sets this policy because people like me spend an awful lot of time on really weird websites trying to break in through various, uh, I would say, either foreign or local airports, being able to use other people's glasses to be able to break into a system to enact a bunch of policy, do a bunch of research to enact the policy based on what the government was sort of recognizing. 